Today, I'm going to take you on a journey that for me began in my early 20s when I donned the wetsuit, scuba tank, fins and a mask and took the plunge into Port Phillip Bay. My absolute curiosity whilst diving and the lingering desire to do more to protect the place where I found myself, the place where I fit, the place where I felt totally at peace, changed the course of my life. A famous Jane Goodall quote stays with me always and goes something like this. You cannot get through a single day without having an impact on the world around you. You can make a difference, and you need to decide what kind of a difference you want to make. My absolute passion for all things marine grew so much so that some six years later, I had to decide on what kind of a difference I wanted to make. So I made the difficult decision to ditch my career in post-production, to take the next plunge and head back to university to study a Bachelor of Science degree. By the late 90s, another amazing moment happened that changed the course of my life. I was introduced to the beautiful dolphins of Port Phillip Bay. The pfft of a dolphin's blow as it breaks the surface to breathe, their inquisitive nature and playful interactions was to me like you had me at hello from the Jerry Maguire movie. And it doesn't matter how many times I see these amazing dolphins, they still inspire me. But this kind of underwater footage didn't exist way back then. And there are a lot of questions about these dolphins. It was a small population living in Port Phillip Bay but was it a common bottlenose dolphin or was it an Indo-Pacific bottlenose dolphin? Now, a common bottlenose dolphin are found all across the globe and they're lovingly referred to as the rats of the sea by our whale biologist friends. Whereas the Indo-Pacific bottlenose dolphin, as the name suggests, are restricted to the warmer waters of the Indo-Pacific region, thus may afford a higher conservation value. So being a fresh-faced, gonna save the world student, I was going to answer the question, or so I thought, about which of those two it was. Now, the Port Phillip Bay guys were a bit of a mishmash between those two species. It had a short nose and a curved dorsal fin like the common bottlenose, but it was smaller and greyer like the Indo-Pacific bottlenose. Now, it also had characteristics that were unlike either of those two. So, as that student, I was going to discover which one it was. Now, throw in some mind-bending, overnight comprehension of DNA theory, things like hardy weinberg equilibrium, allelic frequencies, and phylogenetic trees. And at the end of the day, I was left with a DNA sample that had me even more curious. Now, dolphins are a cryptic species, and they spend much of their time living underwater, and are therefore pretty difficult to study. This new tool of looking at the dolphin's DNA could answer so many questions. Things like gender, maternal-paternal relationships, population structure, migration levels, and importantly, species status. But this dolphin's DNA left me stumped. This was a relatively simple question. What dolphin was it? Now, after extracting the DNA and looking at the unique series of A, T, Cs and Gs making up the sequence, my very simple question became a lot more complicated. It wasn't matching with anything that I had to compare it to. Naturally, being new to DNA, my supervisor made me re-extract, re-sequence, forward and reverse, send to a different lab, all of which I did, and it still came up with the same result. So what did I uncover? Could this possibly be a new dolphin species? Surely not. A dolphin living right under our noses of a major metropolitan city like Melbourne doesn't go undiscovered. Now, it was only until I placed it in a phylogenetic tree that the differences really hit me. Here we have a phylogenetic tree. And as you can see, there are a number of different dolphin species that not only look different, but have different DNA sequences. Here we have the common bottlenose dolphin, and here we have the Indo-Pacific bottlenose dolphin. Now, our little guys in Port Phillip Bay should fall out with either of those two species, thus answering my question. But all the way up there, separated by numerous other dolphins, were our Port Phillip Bay guys. They weren't falling with either of the other two bottlenose dolphins. In fact, they weren't falling with anything that we had in the world. But you can't describe a new species based on DNA alone. 
I had to prove my discovery using different methods. This time, it was with the skulls. So flying all across Australia, sitting on the floors of back vaults of museums, sorting through numerous dolphin skulls, to trawling through handwritten calligraphy-style notes, to rediscovering lost specimens from the early 1900s. At times, this journey felt more like an Indiana Jones movie than a scientific fact-finding mission. 40-plus measures, from tiny features to total length of the skull, qualitative and quantitative assessments from as many bottlenose dolphins as I could get my hands on. <laughs> Next was getting really dirty, and as examining the dolphins that washed ashore dead on our beaches, looking for what they look like on the outside. Things like length of rostrum, height of dorsal fin, tip of upper jaw to caudal notch, coloration. And in the end, I gathered together all of the evidence, the DNA, the skull morphology, the external morphology, and I pieced together the puzzle of this dolphin's identity. Now, there have only been four new species described since the late 1800s, and this was a hugely scary time for me. A girl from the bottom end of the world working in a fruit fly lab saying, hey, Flipper has a new family member. Traditionally, this is the domain of taxonomists from museums or researchers from world-famous labs. Not someone like me. But hey, you know what? The data is the data, regardless of status and position in the marine mammal world. Now, there was still the small matter of a name. What title would be appropriate for such a unique creature? Now, I've come up with names before. I have two beautiful daughters, Hayley and Alana, but this was a little different. Imagine coming up with a name for an entire new species. I wanted to have something that was reflective of history, something that was reflective of its uniqueness. And so I consulted with the Bunurong people of the Kulun Nation, and a beautiful name emerged. So after a really long, hard road with many ups and downs, fascinating discoveries, and an almost detective-like story, I introduce you to a new species of dolphin, your dolphin, the Burrinan dolphin, Terceops australis. Thank you. Now, at the same time that this journey of discovery was going on, I was spending hundreds and hundreds of hours on the water with these guys. And when you spend hundreds of hours doing anything, you know it like the back of your hand. In my case, I know these dolphins like no other person on Earth. I can tell the difference between them like we can tell the difference between us. Curly hair, birthmark on my face, somewhat short. In the dolphin's case, I can use a unique series of nicks and notches on the trailing edge of the dorsal fin and body markings to identify each dolphin in my population. And with only 120 in Port Phillip Bay and now knowing of another population in the Gippsland Lakes, these populations are incredibly small. Now, I've had a unique glimpse at their life story, and each dolphin has its own unique story. And in a very non sciencey way, they're a part of me, and they're a part of my family. This is Jimmy Fornick, and Jimmy is one of our Gibson Lakes Burrinan dolphins. And the kids at the Lakes Entrance Primary School wrote a great story about Jimmy, who was unlike any other dolphin in the world. He had a short little nose and big flukes, beautiful colouring, and he loved to leap for joy, especially when he found out he was the rare and unique Burrinan dolphin. Now, Jimmy comes from a long line of Burrinan dolphins. So long, in fact, we now know that the Burrinan family DNA is the oldest of all bottlenose dolphins worldwide. In fact, Jimmy's ancestors split from all other bottlenose dolphins over one million years ago. And as I said, these guys are like family. So when I hear about a dolphin's death, I wonder, is that a part of my family? And so I ask to see a photo of the dorsal fin, and I really dread seeing who it is. Now, when that death is associated with something that, like old age, that's one thing. But when it's associated with something we have done, it's much harder. And there are many threats to these populations. Now, I'm reminded of that Jane Goodall quote about what kind of a difference I want to make. 
So my legacy is more than just discovering a new dolphin species. It's to take that science and all the things that we've learned about the bone and to better protect them, to talk and to educate people about the uniqueness of this dolphin, the one living right out here under our noses in Port Phillip Bay. And so today I'll leave you with a final thought, which is the mantra for my conservation foundation. Together, we can ensure what we do today creates a better tomorrow. So let's create a better tomorrow. Thank you.